Evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Can you just give me a quick wave to show me that you can? Ah, oh, lovely. Welcome to our second and final evening event marking our Jane's Walk 2021 Festival Weekend. I'm Rowena McCauley. I'm the City Coordinator for Jane's Walk Colchester. I'm very happy to have local artist Nicola Burrell with us here tonight, our guest speaker. Before I introduce Nicola though, I'd like to say a bit more about the festival with apologies for some inevitable repetition to those here on Saturday night for our lovely evening with Charles Debenham, who I'm hoping by, hoping by the way is also here tonight joining us. I know we have a lot of people here who are friends of Nicola's, if not directly, then virtually. I believe this may include friends from her student years in Belfast, so a big welcome to you. And certainly it includes many who are admirers of her work online because over the lockdown period, Nicola has been intermittently posting her work there and many of us have enjoyed it. Those of you who have found your way to this event via that direction though, may not be so familiar with the festival itself that this event is part of. So to introduce you briefly, Jane's Walk is an international festival of walking that takes place in May every year in cities and towns all around the world led by local people, local walks led by local people and on diverse issues and topics relating to the local built environment. The festival honors its namesake, Jane Jacobs, a Canadian urbanist, writer and activist who died in 2006, aged 89. It takes place on this first weekend in May uh, because it marks the anniversary of Jane Jacobs' birth, which was on May the 4th, 1916. And if you haven't come across any of Jane Jacobs' writings before, I highly um, recommend that to you. In particular, I suggest starting with her seminal book, which is entitled The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Um, when I first read that 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago now, um, it was a transformative thing for me. And in fact, it went on to uh, led ultimately to us setting up Jane's Walk Colchester, the festival here in our hometown. Um, this year, of course, we can't yet walk freely in large numbers, but we do plan to return to the real thing. We had to unfortunately miss it last year, um, but we hope to return to it a little later in the summer. We don't have a date yet, but I'll keep you posted just as soon as we confirm one. But still, we wanted to do something to mark this weekend, and it's a great delight to me that this is the outcome. Back to this evening's talk then, and I'd like to say a few words of connection first between some of the ideas central to Jane Jacobs um, and themes in Nicola's own work, since these two evening events were chosen very much with such connections in mind. Jacobs, who was not of course an artist herself, nor writing about art, once described herself as a natural scientist of the social world. For her, observation and the recording of detail, rather than interpretation, was key to understanding. She encourages us all to make the urban landscape our laboratory. And relatedly, just as an aside here, I found it interesting on Saturday night that Charles Debenham described himself at one point as sometimes feeling like a pathologist performing an autopsy, searching for clues in the putting together of a painting. For Jacobs, even in the apparent chaos of the city, because it was cities really uh, that was what she studied, what she saw was not chaos, but complexity, capable of being understood if we exercise the kind of expertise that she argues we all have by virtue of living in a place. And if we slow right down, slow enough to really look. Hence the connection also between Jacobs and walking. In sum, she once said, if you want to understand a place, I quote, what is needed is an observant eye, curiosity about people, and a willingness to walk. You have to get out and walk. And it's these themes that for me resonate so strongly in Nicola's work. But Nicola, please do take issue with me later if you think that I'm totally pushing this point too far. But these themes of being local, of observing local detail, ordinary detail in our immediate worlds and doing that slowly over and again and over time. Right now, I'll hand over to Nicola herself because I know she'll say more to introduce herself. Nicola, you might just want to double check that you are unmuted. I believe you are. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. Um, my name's Nicola Burrell and I'm a drawer, painter and sculptor based in um, Colchester. And I trained in Belfast and Barcelona, really as a painter. 
but I sort of sculpt paintings and paint sculptures, if you like. I sort of work in between a lot of different mediums, but the, um, the work I'm talking about tonight is my drawings and paintings, um, two, two um, small bodies of work that I produced uh, in Colchester. And the first being my night drawings and the second being about the hive, a lot of which actually isn't there anymore. Um, so I do a lot of drawing all the time, just as a sort of exercise really in, in keeping my hand and my mind sort of in tune. It feeds into everything that I do. Um, regardless, I do a lot of um, drawing for my sculptures and I find that actually just looking at objects and places uh, sort of keeps me in tune really. It's, it's a bit like a limbering up exercise for an athlete or something. So um, I also work to commission. I produce works that I just want to make. Um, so that's me really. So shall I, shall I start? Oh, this is, I'm just starting off with a with an old um, painting that I did in 1983, showing a little walk because I thought that sort of relates to the Jane's walks, and for that I would have gone and sketched each of the buildings. So in a in a way, it's sort of similar to what I'm going to show you tonight, but it's just a sort of map like painting. So I just sort of threw that in as a starting point, and. This is a map showing the little red dots are, are showing where I made the drawings and they were mostly in the south part of the town. Um, so you can see they're sort of really very close to where I live because I, I generally tend to choose to go out when it's very, very cold for some reason. It seems to work best in the winter when the trees are bare and and for some reason, I just prefer to go out in, in the freezing cold. So I'm able to then, if I need to, go back and just warm up a little bit and go out, have a little look at the colours, which can sometimes look quite strange because you're you're working under sodium light. And then we, there are a few that um, I'm going to show just of um, the town hall and then one down at um, the Dutch Quarter. So really, I started these, I've always sort of been interested in night. There's something quite interesting about the light. There's a sort of primeval feeling of danger or something at night that I find quite interesting. I love the way that the street lights light up the road markings and cracks in the road and pavements and just the way the light is at night. And um, I started these when my mother was really poorly and I was sort of going back and forth um, to my house and spotted one night as I was going across the room, uh, across the, sorry, something just flashed up on the screen, across the road, these very interesting road markings. So this was the first drawing that I did. And of course, being night as well allows you to stand in the middle of the road, which you can't do during the day, which is quite handy. So in a way, it sort of no one's out and there aren't any cars. And it's a, I suppose I was looking for a similar sort of situation to the lockdown that we're in now, a, a sort of just a plain view of things without too much clutter or activity. Um, so this is the bottom of Butt Road. And I'll um, leave it for a second. You can see it. what I tend to do. I mean, this one just appeared in front of me and I went back and drew it. But a lot of the time I'll go out and look for, look for things. And then I'll plan the drawings a little bit more. I can see what color paper that I might like to start on. You can see it's quite a limited palette. I don't, there isn't a lot of colour at night anyway, but I'll, I'll just do a bit of planning in terms of what I take out with me. I try and take as little out with me as I can and I sort of put it in my bike basket. 
and um, try and keep everything to a to a minimum. But this one did jump out at me. That arrow just sort of jumped out at me. And uh, that was my starting point. Oh. And this is my road now. They were changing the traffic lights down at um, the crossing of Butt Road and Southway. And they had this brilliant um, light that they used, obviously, for working at night, which just lit, fantastic, lit up the road in the most wonderful way. So that's why I did this one. Um, yeah, just the way that, uh, I can't remember what they're called. Lights. Um, the way it was lighting up the road. And we've still got the sodium lights as well at the moment. And obviously they're gradually being phased out. So I'm quite keen to capture as many of those as possible before they go, because it just makes for a much nicer light at night. You can actually see better, I think, with sodium lights than you can with these new horrible LED lights that are really bad for nature as well. They just don't have a sort of night atmosphere feeling to them. But obviously this searchlight was something else that was quite interesting when they were digging up the road. I did quite a lot of drawings of the people working on the road at the time as well. And then my house, um, which I drew, I'm interest, very interested because um, the views out of my house, I can see the DHSS building to my front and the office block there in the background. And it's quite interesting where I am in the town because it was once going to be the um, sort of business quarter of the town. So there was planning permission for this big tower block, which is quite incongruous really, just sort of sitting amongst houses because obviously that never happened. Um, so it's, it's quite an interesting part of the town that you've got these two sort of quite big office blocks in amongst the houses, which make for quite interesting subject matter for an artist, whether they should have actually been there or not is a different thing. But, um, and next door's blinds were doing quite interesting things on the road there and my garage light. A lot of these aren't even finished drawings. They're just going out and capturing a moment. I'll, um, I do all of it outside. I don't take them in and then sort of tart them up or anything. They are just, what I see at that time, they take between sort of an hour and two hours, maybe two and a half hours max. Um, and I like to just make all the marks outside. It's a little bit like the um, impressionists. They do everything outside and just capture what was there in a sort of fleeting moment. And in the same way at night, you know, the sky changes, the light changes. So you've really got to work quite fast to try and capture what's there if you go back the next night it can be very very different um everything's changed so they're all they're all sort of quite spontaneous um action things really you're trying to capture what's in front of you probably the best drawings um are the ones with the fewest marks where you're not working working on top of you're just making a decision about what's there and and trying to do two things really, capture what's there, but with um, a series of a few marks as possible. And obviously I sort of live in amongst my subject matter. So they, I do quite a lot of things out of the windows. And this is the view out of my kitchen window, which is quite interesting. I can see Jumbo, although you can't really see that in this case and the Samaritans building. And it's, there's another one coming up. And so I can sort of, you know, obviously do my little traffic checks in the morning and see what the light's like. And if I want to go out, this is at the bottom of work, the road at Wellington Street, which is quite funny. They seem to have installed the, um, that street light the wrong way around. It's got, um, They've made it face the building, but it just throws this fantastic light up onto the gable end of that house. And that's an interesting little road to draw. 
Oh, I can't make it. Oh, good. Oh, here's an example of a terrible drawing. I thought I'd put the put a range of drawings in. It's um, I love that tower block. That's why I've left it in. But it's such a jumble, really. There isn't a um, definite sort of light source or anything. To me, it's just absolutely hideous. But I thought I'd just put some bad ones in as well because I'm just collecting information. So uh, I didn't really know where these were going when I started them. They could have led to some paintings. As it was, they are just a series of drawings, but um, you know, I might just draw a little bit of something or the corner of something just because it's, it's all information that I can, I can use. This, and, and really, um, these drawings came alive when I started to post them on the Colchester and District site. And I think I'm, this was one of the first ones that I, I showed. And just the comments were just absolutely fabulous for this. Um, we had, I've got his name somewhere, but I, I won't find it now. Talking about how he lived um, in Cedars Road as a child. And there was obviously no toilet or bathroom in the house. And they didn't have a fridge till he was seven. And they used to go and, in inverted commas, borrow ice cubes from um, the factory down the road and kick them down the road because they didn't have a football. <laughs> and then um, someone else had a, a nightmare neighbor who was um, at the, the um, Evening Gazette called, um, Oh, God, what was it? I should, I should have this bit of paper. But anyway, he buried, um, or he used to keep rabbits and ducks under the floorboards. And then he went and uh, chopped her TV aerial down. And then one night he broke into the house. Oh, it's public enemy number one, the Evening Gazette called him. He went and uh, broke into her house and used the telephone because he'd put the put the bar fire too close to his daughter's bedding in her bedroom and set light to her bedroom. And then it finished, I could go on, but I just thought, oh my goodness, it just sounded absolutely appalling. But the, the comments for this particular one, you know, if you, everyone's found this on Facebook, if you join um, Colchester and District, there are just some lovely, lovely stories about people, you know, living in this road. This, this particular one had some just wonderful, wonderful comments. And this is quite different as well, because I just used charcoal for this. Mainly, I'm looking uh, as a, for line. I'm a, I draw with line, maybe. I, uh, mainly, I draw as a sort of sculpture. I'm interested in the structure of things and the line rather than the sort of fluffy drawings, if you like. But this is possibly one of the more fluff, uh, fluffy drawing. The other ones are much more linear and structural. And then I just loved these little school gates. This was a really cold night and I stuck to the uh, frost on the road forming when this one, when I did this one. But I just love that street light. Again, it's just, this is one of the quicker ones, um, the way it lights up the, the, the road markings. So if I'm drawing a building, I'm really drawing it within the context of a street. So really that, um, ties in with the Jane Jacobs thing. And as Rowena was saying at the beginning, um, there is a big, big difference between uh, looking and seeing. So when you, when you sketch, it, it does have a parallel with the Jane's walk. You find that there's actually more there than you thought initially. So the more you sit and the more you look, uh, things sort of appear and, and there is a lot more than you initially thought. Yeah, so I'm just, this is a, again, just up the road from me. I'm trying to think of. And again, the, um, the, that tower block sort of looming behind the, the pub. And I suppose what I'm looking for in my drawings are I don't really like new shiny things. I think things that ha have more age to them 
somehow they have more character. So the I tend towards a sort of cluster of things that have just been built or just happened next to each other over time. And uh, that seems to make a, a, for a much more interesting environment, I think, for people to move around in. I think I'm looking for a sort of element of freedom somehow in, in, in the things that I find. Um, you know, Joan Jacobs was really anti the town planners and, and the way they wanted to control the way that people move around in the streets and behave like in new shopping malls it's all very much a controlled environment and it's ex ex excludes people um so i'm more interested in the spaces that people can use freely um and not new shiny stuff which tends to be really ugly these days anyway um and i sort of fear really for um, the town in that way because everything that is knocked down and replaced is a loss because we don't seem to be able to build interesting buildings that have depth and complexity and interesting materials and so it is generally a loss when things go and it's sort of a bit of a race against time actually at the minute I totally regret not um, spending more time at the Essex County Hospital because there were brilliant views from all of the windows in there. The corridors were interesting, the interior was interesting, so I was very sorry to miss that. And then moving round the road, I'm sort of jumping back and forth here. Um, here's another example of um, something quite interesting going on with that fencing and again the, the way the sodium light hits the street um the painted street markings and it's just quite a good little topography that road of um the little hill with the the big tower block in the background and the little houses and things um so there's a little map of the uh of southway when they were just about to be built and sometimes after just saying i don't like new things there there's a sort of happy accident with a with a terrible thing and and the road and the lights here did sort of attract me to 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 draw it um and just the lovely shadows that were happening on the fencing and stuff i just loved that i love traffic lights but um so yeah the southway did present itself in in quite a nice way twice i think this one was more to do with the the sort of damp evening in that and and again these are horrible led lights but they did cast a brilliant shadow um from the tree looking across the roundabout towards um crouch street on a very wet night obviously after the rain and then moving up to um lexton road and looking across at my favourite little restaurant, Curry India, before they moved the traffic lights. And this um, got some quite interesting comments as well, because obviously it's next to the hospital arms. And um, so people were talking about Ward 8, going to um, my friend's parents worked at the hospital and they'd always be going over to the to the um, hospital arms to get people out at, at uh, when they were ne the doctors, when the doctors were needed. So it was Ward 8. And uh, need my notes. So um, the other end of Southway, this one's looking across up at Queen Street. And brilliantly there, I couldn't get in the middle of the road, but I could just tuck myself in the wall and get quite a good view right across because often when I'm driving I think this is the view that I want but obviously I'm driving and you're right in the middle of the road and you get that lovely sort of forward looking thing so that was nice to be able to tuck myself there 
and I did quite a lot at Headgate because it's such an interesting, this one I, I changed, this was sort of in progress, so I've made this a lot blacker now. Somehow the all the elements didn't marry up in it and it's just very, very dark now. But this wonderful block of buildings to the right hand side on the hill when people used to build things in, a, in an interesting way. And also the backside of the Chinese restaurant on the left. I'd much rather be looking at pipes and just the, the scruffy back end of something which is really interesting than, I don't know, a MGF Roman centurion or something. Um, so I spent a bit of time here that, again, the, the comments on Facebook were really interesting. The second building along um, was someone's office and he, the only escape route was actually out of a hatch on the side of the wall, which they'd have had to attach a ladder to, to actually climb down the front. He said he was just so pleased he'd never had to do that. But again, that sodium light's gone on the right hand side. That's been removed and they've put the, you can see the big LED light at the, at the top left. But I just love this bit of street. It's just wonderful, the hill and everything. And then looking down St. John's Street, again, you can see the, um, my interest in the, the actual, the whole street scene <clears throat> together with the buildings. And the the um, box in the in the middle of the road there. And then lovely church walk. And just these little shop fronts. I mean, they're just beautiful. Just tiny, tiny little road. Just love it. And the town hall just looks so pretty at Christmas. I just had to do a little sketch of that. Just a really, really quick um, impression of just how lovely the lights looked and everything. It's just so jolly. And during the um, during putting these on Facebook, um, some people down at the Dutch Quarter asked me if I'd have a little look at their house and see if I could do something with it. And so I did a little commission for for them. And, and drew their house. Oh, we're back at um, the bottom of my road again. Sometimes obviously it starts to rain during the during what you're doing. So this was just, I don't know, I don't know how long I was out there before it started raining. It's obviously been raining quite a lot before that as well because there's big puddles on the road. And then I got access to um, Wellington House. They let me work from several floors. So I was able to, I like really like drawing from a height. And um, so I did a few drawings. I've only included a couple from the lower floors, but um, I was able to look out over the army barracks and um, that have a very different view of the town, but I just love the way the um, these. Oh God, I can't think. Oh God, I'm completely blank. The um, telegraph wires and things join the join all the houses. Just the way it seems to sort of lines of communication just knit the, all those houses together. And then the lovely little water tower at the bottom of Butt Road, which is now has been really nicely converted into um, offices. And it sort of just reminded me of a cake or something. I just absolutely adore that building within the context of all the houses and the rooftops and the lovely street lamp that you've got on, uh, on the alleyway. So I wanted to do a bit of work about this um, water tower. When I'm doing something, because I'm, I build up my paintings in three dimensions using pieces of wood along along with paint. I sort of build up layers. It's quite important to know what a, something looks like all the way around, so you can see the the outcome. I sort of build up a 
a it's called a relief painting. Um, and I, I sort of start with paint or wood and then I just build up and up and up. But it's quite important to know what the thing looks like from all the way round. So I'll study it from different angles and from different perspectives. Um, perspective is quite an important thing in my work. I'm always looking for something a bit dynamic. Now we're moving down to the um, things that I did 30 years ago. Uh, when I first came back from Belfast, I really missed the docks. And at the time, um, Colchester had a good little working dock. And so I used to spend quite a lot of time down there drawing the buildings and the boats and just whatever I came across down there. So it was mainly along King Edward Quay that I, where I was. Just love cranes and scaffolding and warehouses and pallets and all the things that come with docks. And you can see here just a typical sort of page in my sketchbook. I'll just pull out little bits that are interesting. The pylons are fantastic down there and the electricity substations are really lovely sculptural things. And from these sketches, I did a little body of, um, of relief paintings, which we'll get to in a minute. So how, how I build those paintings is I'll select a drawing and then grid it, and then move to a piece of wood and then put a grid over the piece of wood so I can take the drawing across and keep the, the scale. There'll be something about the, the proportions within the drawing that I want to take to, to the painting. So all these things have now gone, unfortunately, and it's all flats now. So it's quite good to have a little record. Then the dredger that people used to love, that used to go up and down the river and scoop the mud out and go off on boats and be taken out to the water. It's just lovely watching this thing going up and down the up and down the river. There's a little uh, close up of the bucket. So I do, um, I just cut the, the pieces of wooden fruit box. So I've sort of used stuff of the street in the paintings so I often use sort of tin cans or just stuff that I find in the road like cardboard and and then build it and represent it in a different way and the little lifeboat which is always lovely down there the light ship And another light ship. So I've distorted, uh, here's another example of sort of distorting perspective. I've even sent my dad to sleep. Um, and a uh, little detail. So I'll often take the bits of text that appear on the boxes and use that as part of the colour and part of the detail. And also in my work, I do like to produce things that everybody can see. So I'll often look for um, a non-gallery space to exhibit my work. I do stuff in the library and I apply for commissions in interesting locations because I think it's really important for people to see art, even if they don't go into a gallery. You know, it's, it's good to put your work around. So if for everybody, so it's more inclusive. So this commission came up and I absolutely adore this wall down at the high. I love the colour of it, love the street markings in front of it. So I built um, this concrete relief that I sort of did some work with um, the community down at the high. And we looked at different parts of the working river and I used pigment in with the concrete and this was one of the first ones that I made actually in concrete in about 2000 and 
one. And so how I'd have made this was I, I made it with polystyrene originally, and then I took a, a fiberglass, made a fiberglass mold over the polystyrene, and then took the polystyrene away from the fiberglass and then tipped concrete carefully into all the recesses using different colors to mark out the different shapes. Um, but I found that the, the, um, the concrete actually stuck to the fiberglass in this case. So I had to remove a lot of the mold with a Dremel. So that took quite a long time, but it's quite an interesting process. Now I know a lot more about mold making and use rubbers and stuff like that. So you don't get the same sort of problems. But um, I think that might be the last slide then. Oh yeah, it is. My dad's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he's not asleep, he said he's not asleep. We was asleep. Oh dear, sorry about that, everybody. That's terrible. <gasps> it wasn't terrible. I was just going to comment that you're, I'm sure a lot of other people feel similarly about this, but looking at your sort of the later pictures, well, in fact, you drew them earlier, but your pictures of the hide, you know, there's a sadness in that, of course. Yes. The hide that we all remember and, you know, have feelings for. And uh, yes. by comparison with the height we have now, which is slightly disappointing to say that it is, it yeah. is. Yeah. Um. But anyway, amazing, amazing sketches. And I can say for me personally that just over the time that you and I have been talking about this evening's talk, um, I, you know, I have begun to really look at streets, the street differently, you know, particularly at night as well. And I suppose like an, an immediate comment to make that has been that has come up a lot in comments in the chat as well is about your ability to draw through light I mean in a way I suppose that's an obvious thing to say about any artist I can't imagine an, an artist for whom light wasn't important but no. your sketches at night I mean you literally are painting with light almost sometimes it seems that it's only light that um, you're using to dictate the shape of your buildings. I mean, the town hall was an obvious example of that, but there are others I can think of. Um, I mean, you, your image number 17, I don't know whether you can whiz back to that, but that's one I know that's been commented on in the chat tonight, but also is one that, um, that, has, that has been a favorite for people online, hasn't it? I'm calling it the wet street shot. <laughs> oh yeah, that was one of the ones that the, um... I've just sold three of them actually to the um, Victor Batley Trust, which is great. So they're sort of belong to the town now. That is a good point, actually. That's one of the things I wrote down that I forgot. Um, you're sort of working back to front. Normally you take a white piece of paper out and then build up your tones putting dark on light. Whereas really with the night paintings, you start with a black piece of paper or a very dark piece of paper and you, you're you adding the light. So that is a really good point. You work backwards mm, and choose the, the right color paper. This in fact is a green bit of paper. You can't really see the green. No, you can't. It's funny, I spent a long, long time looking at this picture and really trying to understand how you had made it look wet, you know, as the sun yeah. in that, you know. It's the white, you know, you just use the white of the light catching the, so there's a sort of atmosphere, isn't there, there, when it's wet. So the whole of the the atmosphere is sort of slightly wet. So by by just rubbing the, your pencil or your pastel very lightly over the black paper, that, that creates that sort of misty, misty atmosphere. And the, the green of the grass was so sort of bright compared to everything else there. But it is just completely working backwards. Mm. Mm. I might be better with questions. I've got pages and pages of notes. I'm so annoyed with myself. Plenty of questions <laughs> and there are more coming through in the chat. Um, there's, there's a comment from Liz Bowell about, or just saying that the hospital ones are so emotive and saying that she can't look left going up Lexton Road. No, oh, I know. 
And um, I think somebody else, Denise Howe, had mentioned what a, what a lovely social history that your pictures together. Oh, Denise. Yeah, and we, we commented on that in Charles's work as well on, on Saturday, you know, the importance of these kind of collections of work. And I, I wondered, you know, on that subject of social history, how, I mean, you, you, you said that you regret, I think, not doing more drawings and paintings of Essex County Hospital before um, it went. Was it Essex? Yeah. County? Yeah. I mean, are there, are there other spaces that you can think of that you, you sort of regret not having captured or, or you're particularly pleased you have before they went? Mm. I mean, no worries if there's- Well, in, it, all over the place, really. I mean, a lot, I'm quite interested in new towns and I'm, I'm really, really upset that I missed the, um, the town hall there. I didn't really get to know Newtown um, Harlow before they knocked that down. But I mean, the I wish I'd have actually made a painting about the the um, advertisement for this talk. You know, the the tunnel that went across the road to Keddies. Yes. Um, I wish I'd done more about the bus station because I love concrete structures, um, sort of post-war things. And they seem to be getting, you know, people knock those down without much, much thought. Yes. Um, really, I suppose everything that's gone in Colchester, probably do another painting of Claydon's, you know, hopefully that won't go, but... Um, Very much hope not. Can I, I just, because um, I have actually unmuted him for this purpose, but I've just been getting a message from Carl, Charles's son, to say that Charles would like to say something. So I have unmuted him because I think um, I definitely should facilitate a conversation between the two of you. So Charles, please do go ahead. This is Charles Debenham who gave the talk on Saturday night. Oh yeah. Hello, Charles. Hello, Nicola. Hello. Hello. Oh, I can see you. <laughs> Here I am. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that you were talking about that your view looking up the end of Butt Road towards Headgate. And I just uh, wanted to tell you uh, what you missed, because um, if you would have been born about 50 years earlier, yep. you, you would have seen the most marvelous gas lamp there. And um, it, it was, on the side by the Chinese restaurant piece, but the back of the bull, the bull hotel. Yeah. And if you can imagine a gas light there and underneath it was strung out a sign, um, which was also illuminated saying gentlemen and to pointing to the gents toilet, which oh, was brilliant. Just <laughs> on oh, really? the right hand side. <laughs> in one of your books. And no, no, I, I oh. did. I, I, I have actually drawn um, a, a, the, a view with that lamp in, but I didn't do a painting. No, no. Okay. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Uh, I know you're. Uh, uh, if you think of this marvelous gaslight there, with mm. the sign underneath it. Gents, <laughs> and a pointy finger. Yeah, <laughs> marvelous. Oh, brilliant! Uh, You've got I, a lovely drawing. I love, I, I love your 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 spontaneity. It, it it really is quite refreshing to see. Oh, thank you very much. I wish I was a brave play. girl getting out there. Oh, thank you very much. I do enjoy going out at night. You have some really fascinating conversations with people. You know, mainly drunk people, but it's it's oh, always yeah. quite fun. Yes, being out there. I like being out there. Yes, yes. Yeah. The the, um, the the funny thing is now that you've mentioned drunk, um, and the drunken druggies, um, they're not to be dismissed because quite often, I, I've had to point out to people things in the picture, but the drunk community seem remarkably good at picking up on that. I don't know whether that's an affinity well, of, of mind, but, but yes, yes, they, they're quite astute. It's absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Absolutely so. And interested, yes. 
Yeah, brilliant. I love your um, painting of the building as you're going up um, Headgate. It used to be a sort of curved building. It's now the ear place that I went in on Friday actually to get unplugged. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, um, that you did a lovely round, round facade of that building. I suppose, uh, how would I describe it? It's as you as you're looking up the street, you, you've got you've crossed um, Crouch Street. That the next bit you get to, it was a curve, and it's a gorgeous painting that you did of it. Occasionally, I hit it. <laughs> yes, thank you. I love your painting. Fiona, who's here as well, she bought me your book. I've got two of your books, and Fiona gave me one of them. Yeah, I love it. I love what you. I love what you see. The bits you pick out we're fairly similar in that way you don't do new and shiny either do you i i love looking at other artists work and, uh, yeah. and it's, yeah. it's really refreshing to see what you've done well thank done. you very much i love your stuff as well thank you thanks for that i'm glad you like my things oh thank you i've got some lovely comments coming through in the chat nicola uh pam schomburg she says that she always thought Butt Road, no offence to anybody living on Butt Road, she always thought Butt Road was the most boring road in Colchester, but she's now going to look at it with new eyes. And Maria Fremlin saying the same thing about the high, although I should say to Maria, it's a little bit late for that, unfortunately, Maria. Um, Alisa says something very important about that she guesses this is all about learning to see the beauty in the ordinary. Yes. Um, that, that brings me back to Jane Jacobs, but also to you, because there are there are some comments that you've made to me um, previously when we've been looking at your pictures together, which you've alluded to. You've more or less said the same today, but not used quite the same words. And I thought no. they were very potent words, and I've got them written down, so I'm going to quote oh, well them. Done. <laughs> back to you. We should have taped the other night, shouldn't we? <laughs> so um, the first related to Elisa's comment is about your series of pictures at the Headgate. And when you were speaking to me about this before, you said that this always, uh, this spot always reminded you about a uh, sort of the comparison between <coughs> the mun mundane versus overlooked spaces that, that somebody had once said to you that you drew mundane spaces and that you had reflected back that you didn't think they were mundane. Yes. Spaces that had been previously um, overlooked. And I, yeah. just, I thought we have such, um, fixed ideas don't we about what constitutes beauty and that exists in urban landscapes just as it does in relation to human appearance you know and we sort of have to unravel that and undo yeah. and allow ourselves to see again outside those those kind of boundaries because mm. people saying oh you've made a, a an ugly place look really nice it's um I haven't drawn anything apart from what's there. Yeah. You know, it is what what is there, but it's just a case of looking at things, isn't it? It's a case of actually really seeing what's what's there, stopping and, and having a proper look, yeah. as Jane Jacobs would encourage us to do. Absolutely. And, and yeah. in terms of that parallel with Jane Jacobs, you know, she she was very interested in the way things worked in their functionality. And so some people kind of saw that she privileged, privileged that over the way things looked, you know, that she was privileging something that was ugly, but it wasn't that so much. It was that she found beauty. Yeah, in the, yeah, in the everyday, yeah. Everyday. Yeah, so in a way, that is what I'm trying to do. It, show, the, show the interest, show the places as, as the interesting things that they are, the everyday that it does tend to get overlooked. Yeah. Just think it's a scruffy corner. It's not actually a scruffy corner. It's just a really interesting series of shapes, nice materials. You know, they're often really interesting bits of brickwork and stuff on, on older buildings. And just the way they're built, butting up against each other on a hill, for instance, really interesting. Yes. And related to that, you also said um, something to me uh, right at the outset of uh, looking at your slides once. I think you were looking at that very first slide. Um, you said that you had a particular interest in the routes that we take. Does that ring a bell to you? <laughs> <laughs> the routes that we take through space. And the way I interpreted that was um, 
but I don't want to put words into your mouth at all, but this is, <laughs> this is what it made me think of. Yeah. Um, was that, you know, those walks that we take every day. I think it was because you were saying that you, that you drew a lot of these night drawings at a time when you were going backwards and forwards very often at night between your parents' house and your own. Yeah. Um, and so, and that was a walk that you were just needing to do a lot at that time. Mm. And therefore it was a sort of ordinary walk, you know, cause it wasn't. Yeah, it became a bit heightened because of the situation sort of thing. Cause my mum was so poorly. Yeah, you probably looking at things slightly differently. Was yes. That, was that it? Yeah. And I was thinking that the walks that we take every day on our way to the work, work or to station or whatever, they're not the, they're not the walks that we would choose on a Sunday morning at the sunshine and we want to go out and get some exercises. They're the walks that we have to take, but they have very sort of emotive appeal because we, we do them over such a long period of time and we yeah, them know much. them so well. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to keep an eye at the same time on questions to see if there are uh, questions coming through that I've missed. It was quite nice actually in lockdown, you know, when you'd go into into town and you could actually see, I think a lot of the time you can't really see because there's just so many cars everywhere. You know, it's actually quite difficult to see what's there because there's just so much frenetic stuff going on and just cars and vans and lorries and fumes. It's actually quite difficult to see how lovely parts of it really are. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got um, a question here about, it's, it's really just from me again, actually. Um, it's about the little water tower on Butt Road. Well, it's oh, yeah. Really, I love your sketches of that tower. Um, and I think you, 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 were, you were talking a bit about your process then, which I found really interesting. And that idea that you often sketch something in its full surround um, before you commit to the actual. Yeah product you know there's something about needing to understand it kind of 360 degrees before yeah to know what's at the back to know what's at the front yes and so I really enjoyed those those comments that you made there about your process I don't know whether there's anything you know to expand on there or maybe you know what is it that decides you to take a particular sketch forward to to a painting or to a finished thing and and then others remain just part of the process? I think it's a lot to do with um, perspective with me, really. There'll be something dynamic about the viewpoint. So I spend quite a lot of time looking for, for a particular viewpoint. Um, my work's always been quite rooted in perspective. I'll, I'll also distort perspective quite a lot and try and get more into a scene when I actually make it than that actually exists. Um, I sort of squash space and expand space so the viewer can get more of an idea of the, the whole area rather than just one particular fixed viewpoint. So these these um, night drawings would be one fixed viewpoint, but a lot of my paintings, I'll, I'll, I really will sort of play with space and, and distort it to try and show more than what's actually there or the, more than more than what's there from one viewpoint. So it will be something about the dynamic of, of the composition, really. I'm looking for, for composition when I, when I build a painting. Composition and viewpoint, really. Mm. Okay, and I've got some um, other questions through, coming through that are also about sort of process and technique. Um, one from Charlotte Webb. I'm sorry, Charlotte, because yours was the very first question to be asked and I wrote it down here, but then overlooked it. Um, and it is, do you have a strict color palette for your nighttime drawings? I have a limited palette. So I really generally go out with darks, orange, a sort of off-white, um, or maybe go out with maybe just four sticks of colour with me, really, four or five sticks of colour. And sometimes it's quite shocking. You go home and because you've been under the sodium lights, if I've got a little tin of stuff, of, of pastels with me, I get back sometimes and I'm quite horrified, you know, because 
the colours look, every, everything just looks brown under the sodium lights, all the beautiful bright orange, everything just sort of goes brown. Um, so I might have to then go back out with the appropriate colour and sort of take it all back a little bit. But really, it's a very minimal palette. You could just go out with a few browns, a, a white and a and black, or as close to black. I don't tend, this one's got black in it that we're, we're looking at here, but I tend to avoid white, actual white and actual black. They'll, they'll be off, off being, you know, the extremes, because black's a bit, kills things a little bit. So, yeah, just a few a few colours. Let's have a little look. Oh, it's doing its thing again. And how do you um, physically sketch outside? The question. Oh, that one's got a lot of colour. Um, yeah. Well, just the same way as I'd normally draw. Really, I've, the 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 ones I've done more recently, um, I've taken my mobile with me, and that's quite good. You know, just to to light it up every now and again, just to to look at my colours and stuff. Um, but just in the same way as it, in the daytime, I suppose, because you, your um, drawing shows up a little bit um, e even in the night because you're pulling the lights out. But you are working under quite difficult light conditions. And at the time, my studio at home didn't have very good lighting either. So I'd sort of go back in and, and um, it was quite dim. So um, I'd have to take them upstairs sometimes just to have a little look but it is quite deceptive at night. You can see here, it's just browns, off-whites, very dark gray. And really that in these, these um, drawings that you don't really have even as much color as what you're, as I've, I've put down, you know, the color goes at night. It's just very, very tonal. And are all of your sketches sort of finish there and then in situ or do you ever come home and continue to work on them no all, all done outside you know I might just tweak a tiny little bit inside but I don't like touching them when I'm when I'm back in because the moment's lost so really you've got up to two hours to try and get everything that's in front of you down and try and capture that particular moment in time you're just trying to capture that particular moment in time as quickly as you can really um, and just trying to make each each time you touch the the paper has to sort of mean something. You're making a mark which directly relates to to what you're seeing. Mm. So trying to make as few marks as possible, really. Even though there are a lot of marks on that particular one here, you can see there are quite few lines really in that. It's quite linear that one and then just disappears around the corner this one maybe three colors only i think there's white there is actual white on that tree those flashing um christmas lights but everything else is sort of off white and then a bit of brown and a bit of black and uh the absence of people is very noticeable especially since that's something that we were commenting on or the reverse of that in charles's work um, I've got a question here from Freya Gibbs related to that. Uh, would you ever feature people in your nightscapes or do you pick purposefully emptier places? Um, I do. I don't put people in them really because I'm just concentrating on the scene. They're almost a little bit like stage sets or something where people could have been or people might just be coming to. Um, they're sort of incipient scenes, if you like, where maybe something could just about to be happening. So I tend to not put people in cars. There's a person in here, the man who used to run the sex shop. He used to go out for a ciggy and someone in the pub doorway. But in the nighttime ones, I do tend to, it is much more about street and place without people. It's interesting, isn't it? I think that very same person, the guy who took a yeah. cig cigarette break in the sex shop, also featured in Charles's tour. Oh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> Not just the like have taken a lot of city breaks. <laughs> I'm surprised <laughs> into Charles there. <laughs> um, okay, a question here. Do you do you think you'll ever sprinkle your magic or draw the new estates or Grinstead or Grinstead? I realise there's a, a lifetime of material to draw in the old town. 
I would draw Grinstead because I think I like the the buildings. You know, I like that um, era of um, building. I wouldn't draw the new. I'd never draw a new estate because I just don't find the shapes interesting. Um, I just find them sort of mean and and hemmed in. Don't don't dismiss all architecture. But I, I I don't think I'd find anything in a new estate that I'd really want to sit down and draw. No. Whereas I like the the blocks of flats and 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 houses on Grinstead and the space around things works well for me. So I might. I might do some drawing there and the shopping parades and stuff like that. I really like. Um, so yeah, I'm at that, that sort of um, era of, of building I'd like, but not that not any of the new things that they're building around at the moment. I just find them really quite offensive and all the new flats that they've built down at the hive and stuff along Magdalen street. I wouldn't, wouldn't find anything interesting in the shapes. Mm. I think you're looking for shapes as a as an artist, perhaps, or I am. Forms and and sort of structures, and no, they they wouldn't really do much for me. Maybe this is a good moment to ask you what you're working on at present and uh, what plans you have in the future. Because I know that, I mean, there's, there's a whole side to your work that we haven't touched on at all because we've been talking specifically about Colchester, but. I mean, some of your bigger sculptural work, would this be a time to talk about that or? No, no, what we can do now mm -hmm. is, is Fiona there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this just shows how blank I've gone. Are you there, Fiona? She is, but she's just left the room. <laughs> oh, right, oh, she'll be back in a minute. She'll be back. Yeah, <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I'm working on um, some large scale concrete things at the moment. And I've been doing that throughout lockdown. And for the last 20 years, really, I've been working a lot in concrete and making moulds. This is one of the first ones, but they've got quite a lot bigger. Um, so I'm working on a series of um, new town sculptures based on roads, um, which have become quite abstract. Not new town in Colchester, you mean new towns as in? Other Essex new towns, yeah. Um, well, Harlow in particular, I've done lots of work about and at the moment I'm doing the sort of road system in Stevenage and uh, so I've got two sculptures ready I've, I've cast four from one particular mould and hopefully this week I'll be casting um, another new one um, where the mould's ready and then I've got a design for a third so I'm hoping to um, build the mould for that one soon and and sort of have a new little series of they're quite big chunky things they're sort of half a ton each of um wow. of concrete all, all one piece whereas this one was actually four pieces um two foot square four two foot square pieces that were bolted through the wall um these ones are just one one chunk which are sort of a bit like chaise longs. One of them is a bit like a chaise long. They're, they're shapes that sort of twist in and out of themselves and flow based on the on the road systems and the um, cycle lanes and, and footpaths. So that's my current project. And then I'm always drawing um, stuff alongside whatever I'm making because the, the concrete things are very slow. Yeah. You know, it takes an awful long time to build, to design it and then build the mould and then take, you know, take a take a um, cast of it and then remove it from the mould and then actually try and move the thing. So it's all quite long winded. So I quite like to do fast things like going out doing night drawings where you get a result after two hours rather than six months. So it's quite nice to work fast in amongst working slow. Is she back? Yeah, I am back. She is, she is back. Oh, brilliant. Oh, look, Rowena, there's a little thing in the envelope for you. Envelope. Oh, that's okay. okay. We're doing this now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> can everybody see you? I don't know. I don't know whether everybody... I can see you. I can see a few people. I can see Andrew. I can see 
Oh my goodness, Nicola, I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> oh, this is a drawing I've been asking Nicola to do for quite a long time. I know, I've done four and they oh, have such disasters. It's that terribly funny, that one. Oh my goodness. I'll hold, I'll hold it up. I don't know, I'll have to carry on talking in order for you to... Can, can people see this? I don't know. But anyway, it's, it's a... Oh, it's a picture of the, the old museum store in the Dutch Quarter at the top of Maiden, Maiden Street. I mean, it's very local to me. I literally look out on this building every day and it's one of the dearest buildings to me. I've had four attempts at that. I did one night one, which actually did come out quite nicely. And I don't know why I sprayed it and I just literally sprayed the drawing all over the drawing <laughs> board. It was just one of those sort of moments where you do make a big boo-boo. Well, that's on behalf of everyone who's ever come on one of your talks and for all the time you've given me to, you know, well, we've been preparing this dreadful talk that I've just delivered. <laughs> but you did. <laughs> you've given such a lot of time to me you're such wow. a generous dynamic lovely thing <laughs> thank you Nicola the mm. thing is entirely mutual we've had so much fun haven't we we have it has been fun doing this it has <laughs> I, I just before we leave the subject of this building can I just say that this very facade here is one of the places in Colchester that's currently under threat or rather we don't really know mm. It. It, the building itself is being developed and the plans that were circulated and the elevations managed to fail to include this facade entirely even though they included four elevations but they still managed not to show this which is of course the very most important bit to everybody so um this is something i'm trying to chase up right now so i hope that it, this isn't a picture of a, a building that we're going to lose a picture of a building it was amazing the light just reflecting onto the road it does fantastic things the windows do fantastic things don't they on the road this is due west and it's at a t-junction and it looks straight up the street so it's got no buildings in front of it so all day long but particularly in the evening when you get a lovely pretty sunset or something like that amazing most amazing reflections in its uh, thank you sort of twisted the facade towards you so it, i sort of distorted the perspective a little bit so it faced slightly facing it's slightly twisting to the right and you've actually got my flat in the oh no i had to squeeze i had to push the windows of your flat back towards <laughs> the even trickery going on there yeah oh thank you so much thank you so you're much. very welcome <laughs> um i'll just i'll return to the chat quickly just to see that i haven't missed questions from barcelona. oh one about barcelona yes so um, John Williams asks, you mentioned your time in Barcelona. Were you influenced by Gaudi? I think more Miro, really. Um, the, the Miro ex, um, gallery at the top of the hill there. I loved going to Gaudi's park. So I, I, I love that park. I used to go up there all the time. Whether he actually influenced my work, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I did used to really enjoy seeing his buildings. I mean, there's just nothing quite like his work anywhere, is there? It's so sort of decorative. No, there really isn't. Uh, I guess people might see that a bit more in some of your sculptures, which we haven't shown tonight, whether they would or not, I don't know, but. I think they're, they're more modernist, really, my sculptures. They're quite minimalist. Um, I don't think I was influenced by Gaudi, actually, no. Okay. I loved him, but I don't think it, it seeped into my work at all. He's a different thing. Lovely, organic. Mine are much more hard-edged and um, I'm much more into hard lines and, and sculptural form rather than organic. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So I um, have a question here from Aisha Guvelli, a very specific one about number 17, which is wet street again i think oh yeah no number 17 off by heart <laughs> um just how long did it take to do it probably two hours wow and they, they take around about two hours maybe a little bit longer um but around about two two and a half hours probably that and yeah. you're out there in the rain all of that time i wasn't in the rain it wasn't actually still raining then it was just one of those very misty nights after rain 
So you had the nice wet pavements and, and the sort of mist in the air. It was a damp night, really. Because you with the rain, the, the pastels, some of the pastels anyway, would be um, water soluble. So they start to do... I think it was one of the last ones where... What happened to the museum store? <laughs> the same thing. Oh, no, that wasn't... Yeah, no, the first museum store, it started really raining and I did come back with a mud pie that night. It was just impossible. I just couldn't even touch the paper anymore. I'm trying to find the one where it started to rain and you can see the way the pastels start to blob. There, you can see in the sky the yeah. bits where the where the wet up can you can you sort of see the way it, it starts to become paint yes yeah so it's done that in a few places so I, I just went in that one reminds me actually of the one that you say that you don't like and it it interests me and I like the fact that you you know you retain all of those pictures so the fact that you don't like them you know you don't get rid of them unless still you know you, oh there's loads in the bin there's loads in the bin as oh well. there's loads in the bin yeah this is a bad one, but with something, it just had the towel block in it. Um, so I kept that for, for just reference. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that, you know, I go out so, you know, looking. Sometimes they jump at me or sometimes I'll go to draw something specific and then turn around and I turn around and there's the thing in front of me. Um, but sometimes I'll, I'll have something, I get really excited about it. I think that'll make a brilliant picture, but it just doesn't work. And I don't know why not. It just, you know, when you actually go to put it down on paper, there's maybe not something, there's not really a focus in this picture in a way, is it? You're looking up the, the street, but there's no focus there. So even though I like all the elements, I like the road signs, I like the tower block, like the street lamp and, and the way those houses are sort of um, back and forth and even the, the houses at the bottom of the road, it just doesn't work as a composition. So it's sort of, it's just a bit of information really rather than a picture. Well, great comment here on that from Jeremy Warren, who says, before throwing sketches away, can you give me a shout? So I think you should have a bin like outside your back door where we can all come along and collect your... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they really are rubbish. The ones that go in the bin, you, I wouldn't give those away to anybody. <laughs> so I have a quick practical question here from Sarah Barker but also maybe from Chris. Oh, hello, Sarah. <laughs> Nicola, when it's very cold, how do you stop your hands freezing? Well, I don't really, because obviously I don't wear gloves or anything, but I, I just find I can't get the key in the door when I get home, because I can't, <laughs> can't actually. You just last out really until, I suppose you, you draw and you time, some sort of inner timers going on in your head. How, how long you can actually stand to do it for, and then you do it within that time. Go back and maybe, I, I generally get this wrong as well, I, I should light the fire before I go out so I can go in and warm up. But I generally think, oh, I'll just go out and light it when I get back. So they are within the within freezing point. I mean, I've stuck to the road before in the ice. Somehow you can just... Yeah. You can just do it for as long, you know, a couple of hours, and then that's probably the limit. And then your brain starts freezing over anyway. So, yeah. Well, I'm I'm looking at the time, and I'm thinking that now might be a good time to sort of draw things to a close, kind of formal business anyway. Not that we've been very formal. So, what I suggest that we do now is that we all unmute ourselves so that we can say a proper thank you to Nicola for this evening's talk and then anybody who would like to you know go at that point please do go but if you would like to stay and with open mics and chat more informally you know, we will be here for a little while longer so if you unmute yourselves now and let's thank you Nicola thank, thank you, you. thank you thank you bye bye <laughs> for enduring that hideously embarrassing <laughs> Blank. Um, it's just, that was just the best Zoom meeting I've ever been on. Yeah, like <laughs> I agree. I agree. Well, it was so bad. <laughs> no, no, it was brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Oh, well done. Well so done. Me, isn't it?
It really is. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was very good. Oh. Brilliant. Uh, well done. Oh dear. I love that you oh, were lying dear. down throughout. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> when I had to. Oh, hello, Sandy. <laughs> That. Hi. Hi, that was brilliant. We loved it. Oh, it was. <laughs> terrible. Yeah. I've got pages of notes here, look, pages of it, pages and pages of thoughts. Um, They're all on the pages. I'll read them when I get home. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm jolly oh, glad you didn't. Yes, exactly. You know, when are we going to see an exhibition? Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. some of them, the, the picture about lay trust just built for three of them. The other weekend so they're probably going to go in that shop i'd imagine that they've that the one which was um laura ashley but really to me they're they're more bits of information you know they, they started off as just going out and do they're, the, they're like the hand and the eye exercise thing that i just do as part of my practice just to sort of keep myself tuned up as i said at the beginning it's just a, a thing, uh, it's like an exercise, really, a, a little test. Do they vary in size, Nicola? Are, are they similar? They're more, they're more or less. These ones are, are meant to, to measure them. They're not huge. They're bigger than A4. They're probably somewhere in between A3 and A4. But quite a nice format, this paper, that I've got in London, which is sort of half the height half the the width of the height which is quite a nice format because a4 is a bit horrible format really i find, always find yes i agree three by two or you know i tend to work in inches i don't like all the centimeters really i don't find they really relate to hand your hand and yourself i tend to all my sculptures i work in feet and inches <clears throat> which is Funny because obviously I, I I think in 1972, so I'd have been most of my school, um, being born in 1966, most of my schooling would have been in metric. But I think if you're working in art or architecture, people do tend to still work in feet and inches just because they're a nicer proportion. There's something nicer about working in them. One is engineering. <laughs> yeah, and engineering perhaps. I think everything's gone a bit wrong since decimalisation in that way, working in centimetres and, and <coughs> metres. I mean, who relates to a metre? I do. You do, okay. Oh, Sorry. yeah, so do okay. I. Everyone else does, not me. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I've ever known, so... Just, yeah. yeah but... Nicola, Elisa's got her hand up. That's very formal, Elisa. Did you want to say something? <laughs> Yes, please. Um, hi, Nick. I was really enjoying Hello. it. Hello. Hello. Nice, nice to nice to see you. Hello. I've Hello. Hello. You, but obviously, Hello. and you've given me lovely bits of cake. But I've never actually <laughs> seen you. Posting <laughs> cake through your door. I just you make a delicious cake. <laughs> it, it's interesting that you see those as um, like the the drawings as bits of information, but um, something happened over the over the summer. We like like many streets. I live on Alexandra Road, so yes, I know. Yeah, you know, lovely. Really lovely. interested in, in uh, the drawings of the area generally, but often but of Alexandra Road, which you know quite often has um, you know lots of negative comments about it because of the night shelter, etc. Yes. So Gets quite a lot of bad press. Um, but I shared your uh, um, a screenshot of your drawing with our WhatsApp group, which we set up over the lockdown. And it inspired one of my neighbours to write this most beautiful blog post, which I think she sent to you. I hope she sent to you. She did. It was lovely. Really moving. But she said that that drawing made, she's somebody who'd moved about ever such a lot. And so she really struggled to settle down anywhere and to feel at home. And just seeing that drawing of our, of our street after the setup of the WhatsApp group, when everyone had been so supportive and friendly to each other, just finally made her feel at home. That's so nice. That's so nice. Yeah, it's lovely. A, you know, it's such a beautiful story, but it was definitely that thought and, and the blog post, which I, I'd really like to share with people, actually, because it was, it was beautiful, um, was triggered by that drawing. You know, lovely. so um, yeah. they're not just bits of information, you know, it, it, it can be so much more as well. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was lovely. But it is sometimes, I found in lockdown, I, I really, you know, began to love the town again, just because it was just clear of everything and you could just see mm. clearly what is actually there without all the sort of fumes in town and all the, you know, it became a bit oppressive, I think, because, you know, you can hardly walk in town sometimes because it's just so busy and crowded and chock-a-block. It sort of gave a bit of an opportunity to actually have a look at the place, you know, when you went to town to do your shopping or whatever, you think, oh, look, all quiet and just as is. There's something really quite nice about that to reconnect with the with the place so that's really nice that she she found something in that picture and and connected with it it's lovely maybe it was all of those telegraph poles you know collected connecting all the houses which i think is why i drew it why i drew the the street from that angle just because it was so fascinating just looking at that sort of spider's web of of communication lines between all the houses that sort of connection yeah, maybe. I mean, I think it's a really interesting street. All the houses are really different. It's a lovely street. They're all built in different, you know, in, at, at different times. Some of them yeah. are you know. You've got lovely, lovely tall houses, houses, haven't you? You've got the steps yeah. up to them and you've got little gardens in the front. And yeah. like they're all different sizes. You've got the, the fact that it's on a hill always makes it an interesting topography, doesn't it? Having yeah. houses and streets on hills. You've got pub at the top, you know, the sex shop probably that well that bit did used to be a lot more shoppy didn't it we used to have a little corner shop and a photographer's um set yeah. up and yeah. there with that um uh, the bad cat no the the bad owl is it oh the bad owl yeah. yeah yeah that's a lovely little cafe isn't it that's brought a bit of life to that to that bit and you've got bits right up against the the butt road there so i find that that bit of butt road really fascinating you've got some lovely little alley we did a Jane's walk a few years ago about the the little alleyways that lead off there to to steps going up to houses and just a change in level there because I'm really the other side of Butt Road and one side of my garden I'm sort of looking right up at my neighbours you know 10 foot and then the other down at, looking down at the next ones on Butt Road by another 10 foot you know it's really quite a steep hill and it just makes for fascinating buildings, really, because they're all quite old and they were built. That was in. great, James Walk. I did. I was on that trip, James Walk. Were you? We saw you. <laughs> did you yeah. come in? Yeah. Oh, did you? <laughs> Sorry, I so I have actually met you. God, it's getting worse. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you've come in. Oh, good. <laughs> come again. <laughs> I'll give you a bit of cake. <laughs> Nicola, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. Hello, Steve. Hi there, Nicola. Long time no see. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was really, really good. I was a little bit late. I'm sorry I had another Zoom meeting, but I didn't miss much. Um, no, yeah, didn't. I was going to I think it was a, I think it was a point that um, Antoine raised um, in, the, in the chat room, which was, have you thought of um, um, make it into book, your, your, your drawings? I think you'll make an excellent book. Yes, people have said that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a possibility. I need to. Um, I need to document everything properly. You know, I need to get yeah. some proper proper slides of things. Yes, they could. Then someone else has been suggesting a calendar. As another, oh, yeah, mm. yeah, they're all winter, mind. Yeah, pictures are all winter. <laughs> so I don't know how well that would work. But perhaps now would be a time to pull things to a close what do you think it's just been it's been wonderful Nicola and it's been so much fun so much again um Thank you. and uh well why don't we just finish with a round of applause and then we'll we'll start. <laughs> brilliant thank you you all as, as always thank you. yes thank you bye, bye. 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 bye.